Welcome to this seminar at the Institute of Advanced Research in Artificial Intelligence in Vienna. I'm David Krein, and I have the honor of being your host today. Today's speaker is Professor Andreas Geiger from the University of Tübingen and the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. He plays a leading role at the European Lab for Learning and Intelligent Systems, ELIS, and maintains the famous Kitty Vision benchmark. You may also remember that he won the best award at CVPR, the top conference in the field, for his contribution on representing scenes as compositional generative neural feature fields. And today, he will share his insights on neural implicit representations for 3D vision. It is with great delight that I welcome Andreas, as a special guest speaker to the seminar. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome to my, my talk. I'm going to be talking about neural implicit representations for 3D vision, which is something that we have been working on quite intensely over the last two years and has can, uh, become kind of a research trend uh, in, the, in the vision community lately. We are the Autonomous Vision Group um, because we um, work at the intersection of robotics and computer vision and um, we want to make um, robot systems work. And of course, for that, we need to solve perception. And so we work on all kinds of problems. We work, for example, on self-driving. We have just released um, the successor of the Kitty dataset, which is the Kitty 360 dataset. And we also work on the self-driving problem itself trying to combine perception and control um, um, and train these models end to end. For example, as here in Kala, this is an, uh, a paper that we have published at ICCV this year and where we are driving a model that has been trained end to end using imitation learning with a special representation that's actually also using implicit models. But I'm not going to talk about this today. Um, we're also working on uh, fundamentals of geometry and material and lighting estimation. Um, here's an example where you can see how uh, the reconstructions look like after estimating uh, both geometry and materials. And then um, about, uh, we, uh, a particular focus of our group is on probabilistic generative models because we believe that um, building good simulations of the world is important. And so we work both on theoretical aspects as well as on, um, on practical aspects of this problem. And I'm going to touch a little bit upon this in the second part of the talk. And uh, then, of course, we work on uh, fundamental 3D representations. That is the topic for today. Okay, so let's dive right into it. This is the agenda for today. Um, I divided the talk into four, four units. Uh, the first is on introducing implicit neural representations. Um, then we're going to talk about how to learn these representations uh, from images alone, how to build uh, um, neural radiance fields, and in particular generative models for these neural radiance fields in the end. So let's start with implicit neural representations. How does a traditional 3D reconstruction pipeline look like? Well, um, the input to such a 3D reconstruction pipeline is typically a set of images and we want to obtain a 3D model um, that corresponds to the scene that's being imaged. So here, um, the first step in such a traditional 3D reconstruction pipeline is to estimate the camera poses, for example, using bundle adjustment. Um, then we can find dense correspondences across frames to get depth maps. And then we can fuse these depth maps into a coherent 3D reconstruction. So this is how people tackle this problem for several decades. However, recently, um, uh, of course, uh, machine learning has opened uh, new possibilities, and there have been uh, there has been much more data become available over the last ten years or so. Both uh, data resulting from three D scanners, as shown here, um, or here on the um, bottom right, the Matterport data set scanning entire buildings, but also CAD models. So the question is, of course, can we use that data and can we use machine learning to address the three D reconstruction problem? And the most basic setting that we could address is uh, this one here, where we have a machine learning model, uh, typically a neural network, which takes as an input a single image and outputs a 3D reconstruction. Now, this is, of course, a very hard problem, but it's a prototypical problem. So we're going to discuss this problem in the beginning here because it demonstrates how much we can do with machine learning, how much geometry we can infer um, by learning from a lot of data. While at, at test time, we are only seeing a 
single image and want to estimate a shape for that image. Now, one question that we have to answer here is what is a good output representation? The input representation is clear. It's an image. It's a 2D pixel matrix. And we know how to process these matrices using uh, deep neural networks, uh, in particular convolutional neural networks. So this is pretty standard today. But the question is, how do we represent the output effectively? So neural networks have an easy time to predict this output. And a couple of representations have uh, did exist. Uh, before we started working on this. For example, people used voxel-based representation, which is very natural as it's a direct extension of uh, like a, a pixel representation into 3D space. Here in the top row, you can always see like a 2D illustration and the bottom row, you can see the corresponding 3D illustration. So you can generate such voxel grids with 3D convolutions quite easily. And one of the first seminal works that did this was presented at IROS in 2015 already. Then uh, another representation are point clouds. Um, so for example, there's a work called point set generating networks that predicts a set of points from a, a latent code or um, some representation that has been encoded from an image, for example. And then there's of course also meshes, the classical representation that's used throughout computer graphics. And uh, people have lately also tried to predict meshes. Unfortunately, none of these representations are really easy to predict, and they have a lot of downsides. First of all, they all discretize 3D space. So for example, voxel-based representation discretize into regular voxel grids, and it's hard to scale these to really large voxel grids, or in other words, to very fine resolution. And also point clouds suffer from the problem that it's typically diffi difficult to uh, predict a lot of points. And also they don't model topology. And then for mesh approaches, um, there's two types of mesh-based uh, generative models. If you know already the object category that you want to reconstruct, you can use a template and just deform the template vertices. But in general, you don't know this, and you also want to modify topology. And there, this is where it becomes hard. Meshes are not really a, a easy to use output representation for neural networks because you can very quickly get self-intersections. And it's very hard to regularize, regularize this appropriately. So the key idea of our paper here at CVPR 2019 was um, to not represent 3D shapes explicitly, but instead to cons consider the surface implicitly as the decision boundary of a nonlinear classifier. Um, <clears throat> so uh, implicit representations have, of course, been used before, um, but in the context of voxel grids, representing an implicit surface through predicting, for example, a sine distance function on a voxel grid. Now here, the representation itself is a neural network. And uh, the idea is, is pretty simple. So here, for example, you have a linear classifier that separates the red points from the blue points. If you have a nonlinear classifier, as in this 3D example here at the bottom, you can represent, of course, also the decision boundary here, which represents the shape, um, um, which separates the red points inside this bench from the blue points outside that bench. And the machine learning problem here is how to um, learn the weights of that classifier such that exactly that decision boundary is obtained. Mathematically speaking, there is a function f with parameters theta that takes as input a 3D location and a condition, an image, for example, that is encoded into a, let's say, 128 dimensional latent code vector x and outputs a occupancy probability for that 3D location and that condition. That should be, you no. Know, um, zero if the point is outside blue or one if the point is inside red so very simple now um, this function here f models a occupancy field there's also alternatives for example park et al proposed at the same conference to use such a representation to model sine distance fields which has the nice property that at every point in 3d space you know the distance to the surface so you can also do that so given this um, function that we want to model, how do we represent it concretely? This is the architecture that we're using. It's a, a residual network where this yellow block here is one block of the residual network, and we are having five of these blocks consecutive to each other. The input to this residual block is a latent code that is encoded from either 
a coarse voxel grid or a point cloud or an image. This is our condition that we want to use as an input. And we encode this into a latent code. And then this latent code is injected using, in this case, conditional batch norm at the different layers of this residual network. And the other input to this network is a set of points. Uh, here on the bottom, we have three, which means X, Y, and C. And we have T points because it would be very inefficient to just query a single point. So we both during training and inference, we pass many points at the same time, as many as is tractable in terms of memory that we have on the GPU. So in this case, T points, a few thousand points, T. And for each of these T points, we get then the occupancy probability out, which is a one dimensional quantity. So a very simple architecture. And because this is a simple classification problem, also the loss is very simple. Um, it's a standard binary cross entropy loss that compares the prediction of the network for uh, that uh, latent condition C, this is the image code, um, and a particular 3D point P to the ground truth. So this is supervised learning. We assume we have so full supervision. We know for any point that we could query in 3D space, and we sample these points randomly, we know the ground truth occupancy if it's zero or one. And then we can also, of course, extend this model to a um, generative model. What we did here, for example, is so you can build both GANs and you can build autoencoders here. In this case, it's a variational autoencoder, call it a variational occupancy encoder, but it's really just a VAE where we have the reconstruction loss, which is the BCE loss here. And now we have this KL divergence of an encoder. This is an encoding model that takes um, a point cloud as input and predicts the latent code and uh, uh, compares that to a a, a standard Gaussian distribution here on the right. So standard VIE formulation to learn from a, a collection of 3D shapes, a generative model of this 3D shape distribution. Now, of course, this is an implicit model. So for implicit models, we have to answer the question, how do we actually extract the surface? It's not directly available as in these explicit representations. So what we do, because densely querying the 3D space is, of course, very expensive, we query it hierarchically. We, hierarchic we build an octree incrementally by querying the occupancy network, and that um, works as follows. So let's assume this is the true shape here in gray, and we start with a coarse voxel grid like this. We query the occupancy network, the classifier, at each of these grid locations if the point that we query is inside or outside that shape. And in this case, the red point is inside and the other points are outside. And then we can mark the voxels that are between inside and outside points. And then, of course, we can query those again and we obtain this result here. And we can iterate this a few times in order to get finer and finer, but we are basically just increasing resolution close to the surface. So we're not um, super wasteful with computation here. And then we can extract a triangular mesh using marching cubes. And the entire process um, for extracting such a mesh takes, depending on the resolution and the scene, between one and three seconds. So it's not immediately available. It takes you a little bit of time to extract the mesh from this. OK, so let's look at some results. So what we have here on the left is the input image. This is just a 2D image. And on the right is the output of some baselines, a voxel-based baseline, a point baseline, a mesh baseline, and our model. And you can see, because it's an implicit representation, it can handle arbitrary topologies. The topology is not part of the representation because it's not explicit, but it, it automatically emerges during the extraction of the surface at the post-processing stage. Here's another example where the input is a noisy and very sparse point cloud. And we've trained a model. Of course, this is a test example. So the model hasn't never seen that before, exactly that table. But we've trained a model that predicts from such noisy point clouds um, smooth shapes. And this is the shape that is predicted by the model compared to the ground truth on the left. We can do this experiment also for a super voxel super resolution where the input is a very coarse voxelization of a shape. And um, on the right, you can see our results, which is the super resolved version of that coarse shape. 
And here are some latent space interpolations for the unconditional model, the variational autoencoder. So this model is able to generate new shapes that are not part of the training set as any generative, probabilistic generative model is able to do. And you can see when we walk around in latent space, some of these shapes are more realistic than others, but in general, we get quite nice interpolations between different shapes. Okay. What we can also do with this idea of having a neural network um, representing properties is we can uh, uh, represent other properties. For example, we can represent view dependent appearance. In this case, the input um, is uh, not only the 3D point location, the input to the neural network, but it's also the view direction and a point light source location. And then we can uh, query the neural network for the color. Right, so we can, given this as an input, we can out, we can ask the network to predict a color, and so this allows us then to make predictions about novel viewpoints and novel color locations. So here is again the same setup as before. The input is a single two D image. On the right, you can see the results of a simple two D baseline, which has of course of course a hard time to solve that problem in two D, and here is uh, our result for this image and you can see how shadows and highlights move smoothly across the object surface. So the model has learned how um, light interacts with that chair and it infers that from a single 2D image as an input. Now another thing that we looked at is can we represent motion in 3D? which means effectively can we extend occupancy networks to 4D. But it turns out this is quite hard. And the reason for this is the curse of dimensionality. It's really hard to represent time varying 3D shapes. And also there's very little data for this problem available. So this makes these models much more prone to overfitting. So what we do instead is we represent the shape only at a particular point in time, let's say time Step t equals zero, we represent the shape using a standard 3D occupancy network. And then we represent the motion by a temporally and spatially continuous vector field. Now, this is a 4D vector field. Uh, this is also a 4D um, a representation. But the advantage of this is that this vector field is much smoother than the shape varying with time. And so it's much easier to predict with a neural network. We can use a lower capacity network and less data to learn that network. Now, having predicted these two quantities, we of course have to relate them. And the relationship between these two is uh, clear. Um, it's uh, just a simple differentiable, ordinary differential equation where the location with uh, the derivative of the location with respect to time is simply the velocity that we are predicting. And because we know how to differentiate through ODEs, we can integrate this into our model and uh, then update the parameters of both the uh, velocity field and the occupancy network from observations. So here are some results. Again, the input is noisy and sparse point clouds. And you can see how the result of a naive 4D occupancy network, let me jump back. Yeah, it's quite impoverished because of the curse of dimensionality. This is a point based baseline. And this is the model that we propose here. And the nice thing about this model is also that it automatically establishes correspondences. The model has only been trained with occupancy observations. So there was no correspondences input. But because the model learns about how to um, generate this velocity field, it automatically establishes the most reasonable correspondences, which is indicated here by the same color. So you see that the same parts of the human body um, move consistently with the same color. Okay, so this is another application. However, uh, these implicit neural representations also have some limitations, of course, uh, apart from the surface. Um, which need to be extracted in a post-processing step. So one um, problem with this is the structure of the implicit neural representations. And I want to highlight in particular two things. The first thing is that from an input like an image, we encode this into a global latent code, 
um, which means that there's no local information from the original high dimensional input present anymore. And so it's very difficult in this global co uh, latent code to express a lot of local details of the geometry. So that's, that's really hard. And the other problem with this approach is that we use a simple fully connected architecture, which doesn't exploit useful properties that we, for example, exploit in the vision community a lot, like translation equivariance in convolutional networks. And so what this leads to is that the implicit models work well for simple objects, but quite poorly on complex scenes. So here on the left, you can see a result of the same model as before, but not on a single object, but on a scene that's composed of multiple of these objects. And you can see while it's able to reconstruct the ground comparably well, because the ground is always the same, the objects are really bad. And the reason for this is that there is now much more variability in how objects can be placed and what they can look like. And this is something that's really hard to learn for the model. So what we propose to go beyond this simple occupancy network model here on the top is in this paper called Convolutional Occupancy Networks, a model that combines this MLP idea with the convolutional idea from convolutional networks. So instead of encoding everything into a single global latent code, what we do is we encode the input, in this case, a 3D point cloud into a localized or into localized latent codes on a, arranged on a grid. And then of course, because this is arranged on a grid, we can use standard 3D convolution to aggregate this information. Now, after this, we can then still query at any continuous location in that volume by just trilinear interpolating these features that have been produced by this encoder. So we still get a, a continuous feature value at every, every possible location in that volume. And then we take these features and we pass them through a now much more shallow MLP. And what happens with this, oops, what happens with this is basically that this can learn much faster than this model. So it leads to better results also on single objects and it learns much faster. So here, what you see is directly results on scenes, the input here on the left, the result of this model looks much better than before. And uh, the comparison was on the right. And this is a comparison on real world data where we have trained only on synthetic data, but then deployed that model on real world data. And because point clouds are kind of invariant to this domain gap, it works quite well, actually. And here's a result on, on the really large scale Matterport data set that um, we couldn't handle before with standard occupancy networks, but now um, through these uh, convolutions, it's possible. Yes. So all of the things that I've shown you so far, um, we're assuming we have full 3D supervision available. We have training data where we have inputs paired with outputs for which we know for every point if it's inside or outside. Of course, it would be nice to learn these models from image collections alone. And this is where we need differentiable rendering. We call this differentiable volumetric rendering. Differentiable rendering had been successful in uh, classical explicit representations like meshes and also point clouds and voxels, but it hasn't been applied to these implicit models yet. And so that's what we are striving for here. Let me have a look at the time. Okay. So the model that we're using here is a very simple model and very similar to the ones before. We have an encoder that encodes, let's say, an image into a global latent code. And then we have a set of points, a set of 3D points that go into that model. We have a set of ResNet blocks here again. Um, but then here the model has now as an output both an occupancy for each of these points and a color value for each of these points. So we have one shared backbone and then two shallow hats for each of these two quantities that predicts these quantities for all of the points that we input to this model. But conceptually, really simple. Now, the question is, how can we learn this model from images? And of course, we need to implement the forward pass and the backward pass for training with a image based loss function. And the forward pass is called rendering. Right. This is rendering an image. So how can we render an image from an implicit representation? What we do is we go through all the pixels. So here the surface is indicated here by this thick gray curve. And we have a ray here uh, that's uh, corresponding to this pixel U. The ray direction is indicated by W. And this R is the camera center. <clears throat> 
and um, this is the image plane. So for all pixels on that image plane, we have, of course, a corresponding ray, a corresponding vector. And what we want to find now is the intersection of that ray with the um, level set of that occupancy function, let's say 0 0.5, where tau is equal to 0 0.5. So we go through all the pixels and then we find the surface point p hat here along that ray w via ray marching and root finding. So we go in equidistant steps and then we see when the sign changes, uh, when the function changes from being smaller than the threshold to bigger than the threshold. So the surface must have must lie in between. And then we can just numerically find this intersection using the second method. And that's now um, we have found that intersection. We call that p hat because that's the predicted surface given the current parameterization of that occupancy network. Now, of course, we have also the texture hat, as explained on the slide before. So we can evaluate for that point p hat the texture, and we get a color red in this case, and we can insert that color here. And we can insert that color not only for this pixel, but we can do the same process for all of the pixels in the image and thus get a rendered image from this implicit representation. Now, the question, of course, is how to implement the backward pass. We need to have a differentiable backward pass. And before we go into that, let's um, first recap some basic math that's required for this. Um, so what we need for this is uh, we need to be familiar with implicit functions and implicit differentiation. An implicit equation is a relation like that, f of x comma y equals zero, where the function that we care about, y of x, is defined only implicitly through that equation. And there's many cases where you might not be able to explicitly define a function, and we're going to see one very soon. Implicit differentiation now computes the total derivative of this expression on both sides with respect to x. So uh, this is what we have done here. The function with respect to x times x with respect to x, and the function derived with respect to y times the partial derivative of y with respect to x must be equal to zero because if we derive the right hand side, it stays zero. And now we can solve this equ equation here for the partial derivative of y with respect to the partial derivative of x, of course. And this is giving us a gradient of an implicitly an implicit defined equation, even for we can't explicitly define that um, expression here. Let's look at a simple example. Um, the most canonical example for this case is, of course, the circle, which can be described as such. Um, if we and and we can see that this is not a function, right? So it's it's a it's it's rather a curve. It's an, just an implicit. It can only be implicitly defined. Um, so implicit differentiation in this case um, yields uh, this expression. If we just straightforwardly um, derive this here, and then we can solve for y with respect to x and we see that the gradient of this um, implicit equation is uh, minus x over y. And we see that it's defined everywhere where we want, um, despite um, we don't have an explicit function defined here. OK, so this was a little recap. <laughs> now let's see how this is useful um, in order to define our backward pass. What do we need to do to, to define the backward pass? Well, um, we have the prediction. Um, and the pre prediction is given through the forward pass that we've just seen. And we have an image observation i. The prediction is i hat and the, Im the observation is i. And we want to minimize the error between these two. And we do this through a image-based loss function. I could say it could be one that says, well, we sum over all the pixels and we want to minimize, let's say, the L1 or the L2 distance um, of all the pixels between the observation and the prediction as indicated here. Now, how does the gradient of that loss function with respect to the parameters theta, these are the parameters of the architecture that I've shown you before, that contains both the backbone as well as the two shallow heads. How does this gradient look like? Well, of course, we need the chain rule, first of all, um, to derive um, the uh, to differentiate the loss function with respect to the parameters. So we get the loss with respect to the prediction 
times the prediction with respect to the parameters. And then we have to look into how this looks like. So this is the prediction with respect to the parameters. And um, because the prediction, um, uh, which is t of, uh, this is the color at that point, t, t of p hat depends on theta through t, because the texture network depends on theta, but also um, it depends on theta through p hat, because that intersection with respect to that level set here depends, of course, on the geometry. And the geometry depends also on the parameters theta. We need to use the rule of total differentiation here. So we have the derivative of t with respect to theta times the derivative of t with respect to p hat times p hat with respect to theta, because p hat depends on theta. Now, these two expressions are easy to calculate. This is just standard backprop through our network architecture. We know how to do this. But how can we compute this expression here? And this is where implicit differentiation comes in. We implicitly differentiate the level set constraint. This is the constraint that must hold. Remember from the previous slide that we want basically the surface to lie at um, the point where or lie where the f function takes value theta, uh, value tau, sorry, tau, it's tau. Um, and so implicit differentiation of this level set expression yields a gradient, a closed form analytical solution for the gradient of the intersection point p hat with respect to the parameters theta. And that's really nice um, because now we can compute all the gradients and we can update as indicated here, we can update um, the geometry and the texture. We can update all of the parameters to make the observation to uh, to make the prediction come closer to the observation. So we have an analytic solution, and there is no need for storing intermediate results as, uh, for example, in uh, voxel-based rendering, where you have to keep all these intermediate results along the voxels that intersect the ray. Now, of course, I didn't tell you yet how exactly we get to this expression, but it's it's really just a straightforward application of the uh, implicit differentiation rule that I've shown you before. And I'm going to quickly show you this now. So consider a ray. This is the ray again from before, where um, the surface intersection we had can be modeled by the ray starts at the camera center. And then we go into this direction and we go um, um, into direction w um, and scale that with d hat, which is where p hat lies. Basically, this is the depth. This is how we can represent that ray. Now, by implicit differentiation of the level set constraint on both sides with respect to theta, um, we obtain this expression here also because, of course, this function here depends on theta directly, but also depends on theta through the um, p hat point that depends on theta as well. So we need to apply the total derivative here on the left hand side. And now what we can see is um, that, well, this uh, derivative here, um, p hat with respect to theta, is um, this is exactly what we are looking for. So we can rearrange this expression such that we can solve it for p hat with respect to theta. And this is illustrated here. And this is the expression that I had on the slide before. So it's really nice. So we can have this analytical solution to this expression. And through the smoothness properties of the neural network, we automatically uh, propagate geometry, if you will. We diffuse geometry or diffuse like the gradients that we that we back propagate into the neighborhood and not just at the surface where we actually apply the supervision. And this is kind of the intuition why this works. So let's look at some results here, the input. So what we have done here is we have used this model. We have used this type of image based supervision to uh, train again, a model that predicts from a single image, a 3D reconstruction, but now we, we haven't used 3D supervision anymore. And we compare this to another 2, 2D supervised baseline, a 3D supervised baseline. And, and this is the results that we obtain. Of course, in this case, it's very hard because it's a very textualist object. So actually on, on this type of data set here, uh, it's very hard to uh, apply these loss functions, but it works to some degree, as you can see. And here's another example for cars. 
Okay. And what I also want to show you is that this model can also be applied to multi-view reconstruction. In this case, we have we have applied it to the DTU data set, which is a real-world multi-view reconstruction data set where there's too little images to learn such a single image to 3D reconstruction model, but we can still overfit that model to a set of images and get a 3D reconstruction out. So we can demonstrate that it actually also works in real data, um, reconstructing like a standard 3D reconstruction approach without conditioning on any um, latent code in this case, because we are overfitting to one scene. OK, so let's move on. Um, the next topic I want to talk about, and these last two topics are shorter, is neural radiance fields, which has been a work that has made a big splash. And there's a lot of follow-ups on this work already. And we have also worked on this. Um, and this is a direct uh, follow-up again on, on our occupancy networks um, work. So the idea here is also to use an MLP uh, to map a 3D location and a view direction, like in the texture fields approach that I've shown you. Um, but now we don't map it to the occupancy, but we map it to an output density. So we can also model translucent surfaces. And we, we also map it to, of course, the color. And the task here is not primarily to reconstruct geometry, but given a set of input images of a scene to solve the so-called novel view synthesis task, which is rendering an image from a novel viewpoint as photorealistically as possible. And uh, again, a vanilla ReLU MLP is used here that maps from the location and the view direction to color and density. And uh, this conditioning on the view direction, as in texture fields, allows for modeling view-dependent effects. And uh, in order to render now these images and to train this model, also basically an image-based um, model is used. So we, this model can be trained from 2D images as input. And uh, this rendering works very similar to traditional ray tracing graphics. We shoot a ray through the scene, sample points along the ray, and then query the radiance field along these rays to obtain color and density, and then basically apply alpha composition to composite these colors with the densities into the color value of a single pixel. And then we use this. We compare these images to the observations and use this signal for training. And uh, there have been really Amazing results been demonstrated with this technique. This is this is the first paper that came out, and there have been many follow-up works on um, making this better. One um, problem with this model is, of course, uh, that it's very slow to train. So it takes typically like a, a, a couple of hours to train, sometimes even days. And it's also very slow to render novel views. And of course, this is a problem if you want to apply this in AR or VR applications. And we have um, uh, investigated one extension of this model where we have replaced this single MLP that tries to represent the entire scene through thousands of very, very small MLPs. And surprisingly, they can reach the same image fidelity when rendering novel viewpoints, but at much faster speed. So you can get real-time performance with this, um, what we call kilo nerf. And there's some other methods that also um, use uh, similar strategies in order to improve uh, rendering time of these models. But what this demonstrates really is that these models might soon be become useful also for, for computer graphics and uh, as a representation for rendering. OK, good. So um, let's come to the last chapter, which is on taking these radiance field models and extending them towards generative models that can be trained from images alone. In this case here, the representation, uh, the, the model has assumed that the cameras have already been calibrated extrinsically and intrinsically, which means you have to run a bundle adjustment to get the camera poses and you have to have many images from the same scene and the model is is overfit to a single scene but what if you just have an image collection where maybe you have just a single image per object and you don't know the camera pose so this is what we are tackling here and we call this generative radiance fields <clears throat> so the idea is to build a generative model for radiance fields where we train this on unstructured and unposed 2d image collections and then afterwards, we can sample novel shapes and novel appearances from that model. 
So it's a standard GAN setting where we have a, a latent code here that we sample. And then we have a radiance field that maps the viewpoint and the 3D um, location of that point and the conditions that we sampled to the color and the density for rendering a new image um, of an unseen object. However, the challenges for training such a model is that uh, we can't directly apply a, a adversarial loss in 3D because, of course, we don't have 3D supervision. So we have to supervise in 3D with, in, in 2D with our images, but volumetric rendering is slow. So the way we solve this is that we build a model that renders patches, which is faster. And then we also take patches from real images and compare these rendered patches to the real patches. Okay. So this is what this model looks like. We take a radiance field. Um, this is the what we call a conditional radiance field because it's also conditioned on uh, some latent codes, which will I, I will show. And that radiance field maps a 3D point and a view direction like NERF to color and density. And we do this for all rays or for all pixels in order to then volume render an image or a patch. And then we condition this radiance field. That's why it's called a conditional radiance field. Additionally, on a shape latent code and an appearance latent code, as illustrated here. And uh, the generator repeats this entire process for all of the rays. And we sample these rays now, not for every pixel in the image, but we sample them sparsely based on a patch that we it's a 32 by 32 pixel patch that we place randomly in the scene with random dilation factors, random scaling, basically. And we also um, choose the intrinsics of the camera and the extrinsics, the pose of the camera randomly. So we want to basically capture the entire viewing sphere and generate something. And that generated something should look uh, very similar to our data set that we supply as input. So we use this patch generator to predict a patch. And then we extract a similar patch from real images. And then we have a standard adversarial loss as in a standard GAN. And because these are just 32 by 32 pixel patches, this discriminator is actually quite shallow and easy and fast. So it, it works. We just have a four layer confnet here for the discriminator. So here are some results of this. This is what comes out of our method. Uh, remember again that we have only used an unstructured and unposed collection of RGB images for training. There was no depth and there was no pose available. Yet we are able to um, generate novel shapes from that trained model and we can view that these novel shapes from novel viewpoints and we can change the shape and the appearance of these. And we can also infer the depth because the depth has, the model has to implicitly reason about depth in order to actually uh, synthesize realistic appearance. And so it works also for cats and birds and faces, not only for cars. Okay, and then finally, um, I want to show you quickly Giraffe, which is our already mentioned CVPR 2021 paper. That is an extension of graph um, to multiple objects. The goal here is now even more challenging. Again, from a collection of unstructured and unposed 2D images um, as input to the model, as training signal, we want to learn a representation, but now a representation that not only learns about geometry and appearance of a single object, but it learns about multiple objects and disentangles the different, the various objects in the scene from each other in order to afterwards be able to composite novel scenes, maybe even with more objects than were present during training in novel out of distribution viewpoints or um, with novel shapes and geometries. And the way we do this is we use a such a what we call a feature field. We're predicting not the radiance here, but we're predicting a feature. And that's crucial to this approach because uh, as already mentioned, predicting radiance and then doing this densely for many, many uh, pixels in the image is very slow. Um, so to speed this up, we, instead of predicting free values and the density, we predict an entire feature vector. And then we render a low resolution feature image that we can then decode again using a 2D image decoder. We lose a little bit of, of 3D consistency, of course, via that. But this enables us to train this model. So rendering these feature images and rendering them at low resolution and then decoding them because we have the features into 
like let's say 256 square pixel resolution. And uh, the way we do this is we have a model that predicts these feature fields independently per for each of the objects in the scene. So for each of these objects, we sample a latent code for shape and appearance, and we sample a latent code for the pose. And then we composite these radiant fields because composition of these of this, uh, feature fields actually is, is, is easy. And uh, then the composite result, we render into the feature image, and then we decode into the 2D image. And through this bottleneck, through this 3D bottleneck, um, we obtain an inductive bias that allows us to disentangle the various uh, components of the scene. Of course, the scenes can't be too complicated, it's still kind of object-centric scenes, but it works for also for real-world examples. So here are some results of this model. This is a comparison against a 2D-based GAN. And if you use a 2D-based GAN on these data sets that I'm going to show you, this is the clever data set, the 2D based GAN cannot completely disentangle the various factors, the underlying factors of the image generation process. You see, if I move one object, the other moves as well, or the shape or the appearance changes. But because we have learned that object centric representation in 3D, we can now move individual objects, as you see here. And we can also move them along um, uncommon trajectories that haven't been part of the training, of course, because we only train on single images. So we can change the background as well, as shown here. We can also add more object to test time than were seen during training time. So this was trained on two object scenes plus background, but now we can add more objects at test time. So here's an example for cars. This data set is a little bit biased because a lot of these car images are either from the front or from the side so you get a little bit of this bias also in this generation results but in general we can now rotate the cars we can translate them we can change the depth and we can also move the background in this case for the uh, church data set okay so let me stop here and summarize um, I've shown you um, what is possible with um, these implicit neural representations. They can serve as continuous shape representations, and we were not the only ones to explore this. Um, um, for example, there is uh, sine distance fields that have been explored as um, shape representation and also scene representation networks. But all of this utilize the idea of taking some low dimensional quantity and map that through a complicated MLP to another quantity and train the parameters of this MLP and maybe condition it on some input as well. So we've seen that coordinate based networks are or can be an effective output representation for shape, appearance, material and motion. They do not require any discretization as previous representations and are able to model arbitrary topology and they can be learned from images using differentiable rendering. There's many applications in 3D reconstruction, human shape modeling, motion estimation, fuel synthesis, uh, robotics, self-driving, and so forth. However, there's of course also some limitations of these representations. One is that the geometry must be extracted in a post-processing step, which takes time. Extension to higher dimensions is not necessarily straightforward, depends on the data. And uh, fully connected architecture and this global conditioning leads to overly smooth results, but there's some promising directions, for example, using local features like in ConfOnet or in PyFu or better input encodings like in Earth. With that, I want to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. I also put up our blog page here if you're interested in following our research, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you very much for this really interesting and um, super comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, we have a few questions that uh, from, from the audience. There are two regarding specific slides from your presentation. First, uh, Daniel Romero was asking whether the layers in the model from your slide 11, whether these layers are dense. So dense, you mean fully connected or what do you mean by dense? I suppose, but maybe uh, Daniel can... Uh, comment if yes yeah so these are fully connected standard mlps yeah okay that was quick and then rahul <laughs> wanted to know how you compose the feature vectors um on slide 37 
Ah, yeah, so this is basically, um, so here the feature vectors are composed based on their weights and visibility. So um, it, it's similar to alpha composition, but mm -hmm. now we do it with these different radiance fields uh, and we do it for the features instead of the color, but it's, it's, it's kind of similar. So basically you can think of it as an weighted average, basically. Um, it, it's very simple, yeah. Okay. And Rahul wondered whether it would be fair to say that the main reason that the implicit shape representations work so well is because they solve the problem of distributing network capacity over the complicated aspects of a 3D shape. That's a good question. <laughs> so one one thing that uh, like I, I don't believe that these MLPs that we're using right now are the best representation that we can use. And there's various representations that have been used that go a little bit away from that. Um, Siren and, and also ConfOnet and so on. Um, because of course, training MLPs is a non-trivial matter on its own and it takes time. And we have very simple algorithms in our toolbox only to do so, like stochastic gradient descent, which are very slow. Yeah. Um, but yes, so the advantage of implicit, of, of these neural network based representations is that they can basically allocate capacity where it's needed. So they can model detail in one part of the scene and, and be very coarse in other parts of the scene if they're used in combination with the right input encoding. That's actually important. And uh, so that's, I think, one thing that makes this successful. And the other thing we are investigating also a little bit that makes this uh, successful is that there's very useful inductive biases in the MLPs themselves that regularize the geometry in, in useful ways. And this is something that's not very well understood yet, I would say, mm -hmm. but it's something that empirically is, is uh, turning out to be true. And uh, I think it's worth investigating that more. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the the, the cost of, of training. Um, Michael Kopp was wondering whether you could generally give an indication of how compute intensive the graph and the giraffe approaches are and how you think they would scale. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> these models are quite intensive. So like for training, you need to train. I mean, the longer you train these models, they can always get better. Even fitting a nerve <clears throat> to a single scene, you can fit it for one day, you can fit it for three days, and it, it still gets better. <laughs> um, so here, I'm not exactly sure. I, I would have to look this up myself, but I think it's like we are we're always in the order of a few days of training time. And uh, this is, of course, only for these very simple scenes with um, you know, up to 256 pixel resolution and relatively simple, like one or two objects in front of a rather simple background. So um, I, be I don't, I mean, <clears throat> computational efficiency and memory efficiency is one thing, but even if that would be solved, I don't think these models would directly scale to m very complicated scenes without any additional assumptions or inductive biases just because um, the data sets would have to grow also exponentially. Right. And so I think that there's also technical <laughs> contributions needed to, to extend this to like even more real world scenes than these simple car scenes. Right, on, on how many uh, images do you typically train for, for the latest examples? Huh. I honestly don't know exactly how big these data sets are, but it's like order you need like in the order of 10,000 images or so, and then right. you need a, a data augmentation as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, all, all the tricks in your deep learning toolbox to make this work. Mm -hmm. I, I have a final question regarding the um, internal representation of, of, of the learned aspects of the scene. Um, I mean, you're clearly extracting shape um, and you're extracting um, you know, the radiance that gives you the, the, the rendering, um, but, but can you interfere with it in some way? I mean, for instance, could you take a red car and turn it into a blue car on, based on the model that you have? Yeah, so the appearance is one of the aspects that we, uh, in, I mean, one of the latent factors and actually okay. disentangling, um, I mean, appearance includes not only blue versus red, but of course, the color of the car is the most important factor. So that's mm -hmm. going to be the, 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 the dominant dimension. Um, so that that's actually possible. Yes. Okay. Um, but uh, the difficulty is, or the, the, maybe what is a little bit hidden under the hood here is how you can actually disentangle the latent code for geometry from the latent code for appearance. Mm -hmm. 
And this is done in a very subtle way. It's based, it, it's done through the inductive bias of the architecture because the, the, uh, the latent, it, it's not, it's it's shown in the paper. It's not uh, we don't have it on slides here. But this appearance code is injected later into the neural network architecture, where less capacity is available for the model, and also where already the uh, um, like the majority of the of the um, computation for the geometry has been done. So through a special design of this architecture here, and through injecting different latent codes at different locations, you can get a disentanglement that works actually quite well. And this is mainly through capacity, a capacity mm -hmm. argument, yeah. Nice. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we're we're exactly at the full hour. Thank you so much for, for um, joining us today for the wonderful presentation and the insightful discussion. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.